As we've been attempting to find a fair voting method, we seem to constantly be struggling with the Condorcet criterion, that pairwise comparisons are a disadvantage to the winning candidate. And that doesn't seem fair. And so what we're going to take a look at today is can voting satisfy the Condorcet criterion. And since the Condorcet criterion is mainly focused on pairwise comparisons, that's exactly what we're going to do using what is called Copeland's method. In Copeland's method, instead of thinking about it as a big three-way, four-way, or five-way matchup, instead we're going to take a look at each pair. Each pair of candidates is compared the winner will get one point. If there's a tie, we give half a point to each of them. And then the candidate with the most points wins. So for example, if a scholarship committee votes on awarding a scholarship, to one of four students. And to avoid bias in the voting, they just gave them a letter A, B, C, and D. And we came up with the following matrix. First place, second vote, third vote, and fourth vote. Five people voted D, A, C, B. Five people voted A, C, B, D. Six people voted C, B, D, A. And four people voted B, D, A, C. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare everybody pairwise. And so there's lots of comparisons that we need to do. First, we'll take person A and we'll compare them to the other three. Then we'll take B and compare them to the other two. Then we'll take C and compare her to the last one. And that way we can compare all the candidates with all the candidates. First, we're going to compare A to B. In the first column, we see A beats B, so we'll give those five votes to A. In the second column, A beats B, so we'll give those five votes to A. In the third column, B has beaten A, so we'll give those six votes to B. And in the last column, B beats A, so we'll give those four votes to B. And when we add those up, we see A gets 10 points, B gets 10 points, and that's a tie. So we'll give half a point to each. And so let's scroll down and give us a little bit more space to work here. Let's keep track of our scores underneath here. 
So A score, B score, C score, and D score. So we said we're going to give A and B half a point each. Okay. Now we'll compare A to the next candidate, which is C. So I'm going to erase these lines that I just drew in here. And so comparing A to C, we see A beats C, earning A five points. A beats C, earning A five points. C beat A, that earns C six points. And A beats C, earning A four points. And so you can see this time, it's 14 to 6. And so A wins, so A gets the point. So on our track here, we'll add one point to A score. The last comparison with A is A versus D. So let's see if we can, without deleting my entire table, let's see if we can compare A to D. We see initially D beats A. So D gets five points. Then A beats D. So A gets five points. D beats A. So D gets those six votes. And then D beats A. So D gets those four votes. And so we see D has 15 votes to A's five votes. So this time D gets the point. So we go to our scorecard and assign D one point. Now what we've done is we've compared A to all the options. So now we're going to compare B to all the remaining options. So we'll compare B to C. So first, C beats B. So C gets those five votes. C beats B. So C gets five votes. C beats B. So C gets six votes. And B beats C, so B gets those four votes. And we can see this time 4 to 16. It looks like C gets the point this time. So we'll give C the one point. Still have to compare B to D. So let's do that. Comparing B to D, we see initially D beats B. So we'll give D those five points. Then we see B beats D. So we'll give B five points. B beats D. That gives B six points. And B beats D. That gives B four points. And so it looks like 15 to 5, B wins. So B gets the point. So we'll give plus 1 to B. All right, so we've compared B to everybody else. All that's left now is to compare C to everybody else. And the everybody else is only D. It's the last comparison that hasn't been made yet. So we'll do D beats C for five points. C beats D for five points. C beats D for six votes. And D beats C for four votes. And it's really close, but we can see that 11 to 9, C ended up with more votes. And so C gets the point. And so we assign C the point, and when we tally up our points, A has one and a half points, B has one and a half points, C has two points, and D has one point, which means the most points goes to C. C gets the scholarship. 
And that's how Copeland's method works. And what's nice is it finally is a voting method that satisfies that Condorcet requirement that the pairwise comparisons, if it was just a one-on-one -on -one matchup, that person who wins most of those should win the overall election. It definitely seems to be much more fair than any of the other systems we've met. Which begs the question, why don't we use this method? What could possibly be wrong with Copeland's method? What's amazing about Copeland's method is Copeland's method actually works for all the fairness criteria that we've seen so far. It works for the Condorcet criterion, that if we compare pairwise comparisons, the one who wins there should win overall. It works for the majority criterion, where if somebody gets a majority of the first place votes, they should win. It also works for the monotonicity criterion which means if we change our votes to increase preference for one person, it will not hurt that per person. It seems to work across the board for all the fairness criterion that we've seen thus far. But wait. The scholarship committee that we were talking about just found out some new information. What if D was not eligible because D failed his math course. So now the scholarship committee has got a predicament. Does the scholarship committee still give it to C, or do they recalculate the winner? So if I go up to the original chart, and we remove D because D turns out he was never eligible for the scholarship to begin with. Uh, we see we've got ACB and ACB. Those are kind of the same now. So I'm going to lump them together. We're going to call that a 10. Then we have a CBA and a BAC. So let's recopy down what that gives us. So making our new chart with the combined columns, because two of them ends up the same, we have first choice, second choice, and third choice. And now we have 10 people, because we combined the first two columns being A, C, B, all the same. Then we've got six people who voted C, B, A. And finally, we've got four people who voted B, a, C. And so we'll keep a scorecard again, this time only including A, B, and C. And then we'll start making our pairwise comparisons, starting with A versus B. Well, we see A beats B for 10 votes. B beats A for 6 votes. And B beats A for four votes. And just like before, we see A has 10 votes, B has 10 votes. We have a tie, so they get a half point each. So we'll add that half a point to both A and B scorecard. Now we'll compare A to C. When we compare A to C, we see A beats C for 10 votes. C beats A for 6 votes, and A beats C for 4 votes. And so 14 to 6, it looks like A gets the point. So one more point for A. There's no D to compare to, so now we'll bump down to B. And B only needs to be compared to C. 
So let's see. C beats B for 10 points or 10 votes. C beats B for six votes. And B beats C for four votes. And so what we see is B gets four votes, C gets 16 votes. And so it appears C gets the point. Which means when we total them up, A has 1.5, B has 0 0.5, and C only gets 1. Which means now that we've removed D and D was not eligible, A wins the scholarship. Wait a minute. Before C won the scholarship, and then when we removed another losing candidate, it resulted in a different candidate from winning. That does not seem fair either. And this leads to another fairness criterion called the independence. of irrelevant alternatives criterion. Long name. It has really one of two definitions. Kind of the more formal definition is if a non-winning candidate is removed from the ballot, it should not change the winner. Kind of another way to think about it is if A is preferred over B, removing C should not change B to B preferred over A. That doesn't make sense. Kind of another way to think about this example is if you're at a restaurant and the waitress asks you if you want apple or cherry pie, and you say, well, I want apple pie. And then she goes to get it, but comes back and says, oh, I forgot. We also have blueberry pie. And suddenly you say, hmm, well, in that case, I'll take cherry pie. Well, why does blueberry pie have anything to do with your decision between the apple and the cherry? But it seems to have changed the result. That's the independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion that Copeland's method seems to fail at. But before I give you a chance to practice some of these in our continued search for fair voting, I want to look at one more thing that comes out of Copeland's method. So people often notice with Copeland's method, you end up doing lots of comparisons. And the more candidates, you're going to have to do more comparisons. And it takes more time. And so a question often comes up is, how many comparisons do we end up doing? For example, if there were five candidates, we would have to take the first one and compare her to the four others. Then we take the next one and compare him to the three others. Then we have to take the next one and compare her to the two others. Then we take the next one and compare it to the last one. And so we end up with this counting down 4 plus 3 plus 2 plus 1 comes up with a total of 10 comparisons that have to be done with only five candidates. And as it turns out, we can actually generate a formula if we have n candidates. 
we can use the formula that n times n minus 1 divided by 2 tells you the number of comparisons that will be needed for that many candidates. So for example, if there were 20 candidates, we would take those 20 candidates times 1 less than 20, which is 19, divide by 2, and we would end up with 190 comparisons that would be required for 20 candidates to run through Copeland's method. I guess you could even work it backwards. Let's say there were 105 comparisons. If there were 105 comparisons total, we don't know the number of candidates, but we do know the formula n times n minus 1 divided by 2 is going to equal that number of comparisons, 105. And so we can solve this equation. First, get rid of divide by 2 by multiplying both sides by 2. n times n minus 1 then equals 210. Distributing the n through, we get n squared minus n equals 210. And we know from solving equations back in Math 98, we need to make it equal to 0 by subtracting the 210. And then we can factor to find our solution. Factoring this, we get n minus 15 times n plus 14. Because 14 times 15 will give you 210. And they differ by 1. We want it to be negative, so the bigger one's negative. So then we can set each factor equal to 0. And adding 15, we find out n equals 15. Subtracting 14, n equals negative 14. Well, we don't have negative 14 candidates. That wouldn't make sense. So there must have been 15 candidates. With 15 candidates, we'd end up with those 105 comparisons. So yes, Copeland's method can quickly give you lots of comparisons, which is probably why when we have more candidates, we always use a computer to do the calculations for us, because it's a lot quicker. But with a small number, it should be manageable. And that's what you're going to do on the homework assignment. Practice some of these with Copeland's method, finding all your comparisons, and finding your winner under Copeland's method. And in our next video, we'll continue our search for a fair voting method by trying something else.